Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeff Roski, and he's an assistant professor of criminal justice at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Uh, Jeff's research uh, interests cover criminological theory, correctional treatment programs, and social science research methods. And here to he's here to describe uh, correctional quackery, as he describes it, and they're particularly with their use of lie detectors. So welcome him for his talk, The Futility of Post-Conviction Polygraph. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, Dr. Hall and especially Mr. Andy for putting on this wonderful concert, and I'm, or excuse me, conference. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here, and this is uh, one of the more humbling experiences of my life. So, um, Before I start off with uh, the polygraph or lie detector, I wanted to uh, briefly discuss uh, the larger problem. And we've seen that already with the first talk that talked about uh, quackery in, in veterinary medicine. But it exists within corrections also in criminal justice. And uh, the, the term was coined by uh, uh, Ed Latessa and Frank Cullen and, and Paul Jandro at the uh, University of Cincinnati. And they call it correctional quackery. And it's this idea that these correctional interventions, these things where you're trying to go in and affect the offending pattern of uh, convicted of, of, of felons, that these are interventions that really have no uh, empirical or theoretical support. Uh, they lack any evidence that they reduce offending or, recidi or reduce recidivism. But more importantly, the proponents are dismissive of, of any evidence that is against the intervention. So any counter evidence is not held with any regard with these folks. Now, some examples of this that you may be familiar with are things like deterrence-based interventions, such as scared straight, uh, which actually uh, have been shown to actually increase offending. And uh, it always uh, saddens me when I see shows like Beyond Scared Straight, even though we have 30 years of, of evidence to show that these types of programs don't work uh, and, in fact, may be dangerous. Um, but we also have other nonsense, such as uh, pet therapy, aromatherapy, and acupuncture that are all claimed to reduce the offending pattern of folks. Now, uh, just a brief history of polygraph testing for those of you who aren't familiar with it. The, there are many uh, folks who claim to be the uh, uh, the parent or father of the modern polygraph, but really the, uh, the one that is most cited is uh, William Marston, who was a PhD psychologist out of Harvard. Um, he was also, uh, interestingly, the uh, creator of Wonder Woman and her uh, magic lasso that if you got caught in its grasp, you had to tell the truth. Now, his machine uh, just wrote, uh, measured rises in systolic blood pressure when asked questions, and a deceptive response was assumed that there was a rise in blood pressure. Now this case, or his machine, was actually the basis for the Fry standard in criminal courts for over 50 years, or 60 years, up until the Daubert decision in the early 90s, uh, regarding the scientific miscibility of evidence. And um, this case uh, was a, a murder trial that was actually remanded back, and the conviction reversed because of, uh, there was no, or the court concluded that there was no scientific basis to polygraph, that it was not a, uh, a uh, scientifically uh, accepted procedure. And it, it had been kept out, um, it has been, continued to be used uh, since then. Now, it's not admissible in court, but um, it does have or is used in a lot of different uh, arenas. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the modern polygraph, um, it measures four different physiological reactions, blood pressure, breathing, heart rate, and sweating. Um, but there's no question that the machine is actually measuring those physiological features. We know they exist. Now, uh, what's controversial about the polygraph is whether that you can infer deception or no deception from changes in these uh, measures. But there has to be a test format in how you ask the questions. And there are actually two different types of testing procedures that you could do. One is based on, or is a fear-based test, that if you, um, that fear of detection will cause changes in these uh, uh, measures and that this is how we can measure deception. Whereas the other side is actually not trying to measure deception, it's actually trying to measure what you know, and they're based on cognition. So uh, there is some science to this cognitive-based type uh, polygraph or different procedures. Uh, uh, Dr. Tavers talked about the fMRI. Um, I share her skepticism with that, um, but I think as we start moving towards this idea of rather fear of detection and moving towards cognition, we might be able to uh, root some of these procedures in science. Now, uh, polygraph testing's empirical evidence, uh, the most recent uh, study of note uh, was done by the National Research Council of the National Academies, and they were actually trying to 
uh, see uh, or, or uh, dis determine the evidence for polygraph screening uh, for espionage at national laboratories. And they concluded in their uh, study that they, they examined over a thousand different polygraph uh, studies and they could only find 57 of them that approached scientific credibility, but even those weren't very good. Um, but nonetheless, they were able to conclude that these fear-based test formats lacked any real scientific validity as they were done. Uh, but there was some evidence that the polygraph detects deception rates uh, at rates greater than chance, but well below perfection. Now that's an interesting statement to, to look at. Um, basically what they're saying is, yeah, it can detect deception in some instances, but it's not a very accurate test and we don't know what the accuracy is. Moreover, within screening applications, which is the difference between sort of this idea of an incident-specific test where you know a crime has occurred versus a screening where you're trying to see if a crime occurred, um, there's no credible accuracy estimates for these screening applications and that overconfidence in these results uh, creates a significant risk to national security. Um, as you can see, uh, we're nearly a decade later, it's uh, still used, so. Now, within uh, post-conviction polygraph testing, now there was a, a the 1988 uh, or, uh, Polygraph Act came out, and since then, uh, which really banned the use of polygraph in a lot of workplace screening situations, and since then, polygraphers have moved into using it within the criminal justice system. Now, in sex offender supervision, uh, this idea that you're trying to prevent recidivism and keep these guys adhering to their treatment and, and uh, uh, or, uh, therapeutic standards uh, and supervision standards, the polygraph is used for two purposes in this arena. The first is to assess historical offending patterns, and the second is to screen these offenders to see if they are adhering to these supervision and treatment standards. Now, this is actually sold as an evidence-based practice, and they were able to do this because they They've basically papered the known universe with uh, uh, literature suggesting that it increases offender reporting of past criminal history uh, and that knowing about this uh, uh, past criminal history will put pl or place offenders in appropriate uh, therapeutic outcomes and appropriate risk levels for supervision. But more importantly, that, uh, that they'll, this fear of detection will deter them from uh, new vi technical violations and also from new offenses. And so if we actually assess the evidence with that, uh, the first is yes, uh, it actually, uh, polygraph offenders do report more deviant beha or behavior, more victims and a wider array of offenses than a comparison group. But actually we know this from uh, the psych literature as the bogus pipeline where if you hook somebody up to a fake polygraph or lie detector, convince them that it works, they're going to be more readily to, uh, or, or to admit to certain uh, things that they normally wouldn't. The literature actually doesn't mention at all this bogus pipeline effect, at least in the proponent side of things. So, um, The second is this idea of improved therapeutic outcomes. There are, as I said, there are the proponent literature, and there are more than 20 articles out there uh, that shows offenders and treatment providers uh, think that it helps reduce risk for offending. And the thing that they keep claiming in this is that the offenders and the uh, therapists and, and treatment providers uh, claim that it holds uh, or the offenders more accountable. Yet, when we look at this idea of what, what do we mean by accountable, there's only one study that actually examined behavioral outcomes, i.e. recidivism. Did these guys actually reoffend or not? And if we look at that study, it was out of Vermont. It was a very small study, but it was actually, uh, for, uh, for some of the, uh, the social work literature, this is a pretty solid uh, 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 experiment. Um, and this was uh, McGrath and colleagues out of the, uh, Vermont. Uh, they worked for Department of Corrections there. Uh, they uh, or had a sample of 104 polygraph offenders. They matched them with a non-polygraph group of sex offenders and followed them for five years. And they found one statistically significant uh, difference in new violent offending, and that's actually P less than 0.05 if you're wondering what the level is at, um, with three new offenses in the polygraph group versus 12 in the control group. The thing they don't mention in their article is that actually this may be actually due rather than to the polygraph, um, maybe due to what we call a plea bargaining effect, where rather than plead guilty to a violent offense, you plead guilty to a nonviolent offense and get a lesser sentence or the system just revoked them back to uh, prison rather than go through the expense of a trial. So uh, these seem to be more credible explanations for that uh, effect that they saw than anything the polygraph might, might claim. But more importantly, when you looked at sex offenses, there was no difference in offending. So it did not actually uh, show any effect in the arena that it was really trying to affect. 
but also that the polygraph group had higher, they were not uh, significant, but they were higher across the board in total new convictions, new nonviolent convictions, field violations, and prison returns, which goes against the deterrence hypothesis. So when we look at this, uh, this idea of polygraph testing as correctional quackery, it lacks scientific validity as it's currently implemented. There's no evidence for a reduction in uh, sexual recidivism. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just that the evidence, the, the, there's no evidence except for one study. And there's also no evidence for a deterrent effect. So, but treatment providers and offenders think it's useful. But when we actually look at these articles in, in greater detail, we find out that they have multiple methodological problems in research design and analytic strategy, and they, they are unable to remove the confounding from other treatment effects. They don't have randomized uh, selection. Uh, there are often, uh, um, they're just convenience samples. So there are a lot of methodological flaws for the evidence. But also, they, the literature dismisses validity, accuracy, and utility concerns. And I have uh, one article that, uh, uh, that I found that actually claimed that accuracy was unimportant. Um, <laughs> and, and it's that kind of thing that, that, that uh, they're able to use and leverage to claim that this is an evidence-based tool. Now, despite this lack of evidence, the proponents have been very, very good at selling this. Uh, nearly 80% of adult uh, sex offender programs and 50% of adolescent sex offender programs reported its use in 2010. Now, to, to wrap up, uh, the things I'm doing to sort of try and to counter correctional quackery is this idea of using their own findings. And I have a paper coming uh, out in sexual abuse, which is the journal for uh, people who deal with sex offenders. And uh, it's the, I call it the, the futility of post-conviction polygraph testing. Um, and so it, it took a lot to get this paper accepted. It was a, one, a very difficult process, but I'm, I'm happy to say it's coming out. Um, we also, we also, oh, thank you. Now, we also need to counter correctional quackery uh, with solid evidence. And I'm currently working on a large study uh, of post-conviction polygraph uh, using recidivism data from multiple state correctional agencies. I've had the, a good fortune to having worked in the Montana, uh, Colorado, uh, Washington and Florida uh, uh, systems. And so I'm gonna get their data. I'm going to use propensity score matching, which is a statistical method for replicating randomization. Um, and I'm going, more importantly, I'm gonna use uh, better analytic tools to uh, frailty models to acute, account for, first of all, there's repeated measures. These guys don't just offend once. Um, and there's also a heterogeneity of offending that the, the polygraph people don't mention, is that a pedophile is not the same as a rapist, is not the same as a voyeur. Uh, and, and that these differences in offending may contribute to whether or not certain types of tools work effectively or not. Um, and lastly, we need to inform practitioners about the dangers of correctional quackery, and I got this from Frank Collin out of the University of Cincinnati, but I send my work to administrators. I, I email them my, uh, my work just to let them know what's out there, because these guys are busy. They don't have time to really go through the research sometimes, and they're unaware that some of the stuff that they're implementing within their own agencies is nonsense. And so this is sort of the, my, my tact for trying to attack this. So, um, And with that, uh, are, are there any questions? We will take a couple of questions. Got this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, is there any data with regard to the actual polygraph, the admissions of the post-conviction polygraph, as to the veracity of the admissions uh, during that polygraph? Um, are you saying, is there any way to check? Are you talking about false confession? Yes. So, some of the literature actually talks about this. A false confession actually is a wider problem beyond polygraph in any kind of psychotherapy or, or treatment that you're trying to do. Um, and, and typically with this, um, with the therapists, I'm not sure how they use false confession. They talk about certain types of personalities being more prone to it. Um, but this idea of inducing a false confession is not really something of concern. And if you're, uh, more importantly, if you're uh, like a, a probation officer or a uh, parole officer, what are you gonna believe? What are you gonna, what are you gonna take the chances on? This guy admitted to do something or to doing something. I, I'm not gonna worry whether it's false or not. I'm gonna take action, so that, that's sort of, it's glossed over, it is discussed though. Good morning, I have a, a couple of friends that work at the Department of Justice for the state of Wisconsin and I've talked with them a little bit about polygraph testing, they've undergone it themselves for employment and so on. 
the, the question I have is that they're firmly convinced that it's a very reliable tool, and this is in the, you know, the last year or so, despite your admission. Is it that the officers and those using it are trained to believe that it works so that they uh, convey a sense of uh, reality when they go in to interview with someone? Why, are they sort of whistling in the, uh, uh, in the graveyard as I'm looking at it because they're hoping it works and uh, these guys believe it sincerely? Yeah, I, what's interesting is uh, Kim English, who is the proponent of post-conviction polygraph, I used to work for her and she is a firm believer that it actually works. And I tried to no avail to show her the literature beyond, you know, what she, or, you know, her circle of polygraph friends. And th basically, it is they sort of tune out anything that's contrary to what they believe. And sort of there's this seduction of technology, I really think, that happens with the polygraph. You're hooking them up to a machine, and the machine seems to be working. And when they're lying, there seems to be changes. It has to work. And so this idea of I'm not sure how to answer that question fully. Um, because there's a lot of different things at play here. So, uh, and, and it's something difficult that we have to address in a lot of different arenas. Uh, you know, the folks that do homeopathy believe that it works. You know, and, and trying to convince them that it doesn't is, is difficult. So. Well, especially when they've uh, dedicated their profession to it. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. Any other questions for Jeff? Well, let's thank him once again for excellent talk. <laughs>